the most amazing stories in all the Bible. You can take that off. I know he's the cutest up there in the whole that thing. Uh, one, one of the most amazing stories in all the Bible, found in Genesis 15, way back in the beginning of the Bible, crazy story. Why am I over here? This is... <laughs> The wild story, this guy Abram hears from God, hears this voice, speaks to him and says, Abram, get out of the country of your parents. I'm going to take you to a land that you don't know anything about. And God, you know, Abraham's like, here's this sense of God in his heart and his life. And he says, where are we going? And God says, don't worry, I'll tell you when we get there. Don't you hate it when God doesn't tell you the next step? He says, I'll let you know when we arrive. Just follow me. Just trust me. Right? Anybody like that? I want to know the picture. What's the plan, God? Tell me what the end's going to look like so I know if I really want to take this journey. Abram says, no, I will trust you even though I don't know where I'm going, but I will trust you. And it's a mark of Abraham's life, um, just hearing God and then trying to take the steps. But he's a human being. You know, he's one of the heroes of faith. He's one of these big guys in the Bible. If you're uh, from the Jewish roots, man, you know Abraham is your guy. He and Moses, right? They're kissing cousins. They're right there. And Abram's your guy. But he's also just a guy like us. We're going to see it here. And Abram steps out. He goes. And then God makes him a promise. He says, hey, Abram, you're going, to have a, you're going to have a son. Abram's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like you know, 90. My wife's 80. And it's probably not going to happen. We're, we're getting up there in years, God. But hey, cool. You know, wow. That's, that's awesome. Uh, but, you know, it's not looking great. And he, and he tells God, he says, God, um, it's been a while since you made that promise to me. And so how about if I leave my inheritance to the CEO of the, of the, you know, the Abraham compound, Abraham Corporation here? He's been a great servant of mine. He's a help man. He's helped build this company up to something huge. I'll just leave it all to him. And, and you know, it's, it's so typical of us. When, when, we, when we hear something from God and we don't get a response right away, and then pretty soon we're like, oh, I don't think this is going to happen. We begin to think of some other ways God could answer this. We start to help God out. We think, oh, God, you know, maybe you'll do it like this. Or, hey, God, how about like this? Well, here's, here's God's response. Uh, he says, the Lord says to Abram, no, 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 no. Your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son, and, and he will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said, look up into the sky. Count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you're going to have. What a promise. I, I, God, I don't even have a single kid yet. And, and my bio clock's ticking. And if mine's not ticking, Sarah sure is. God makes crazy promises. Oh. He, he's made some promises to you guys. In fact, probably everybody in this room has heard something from God. Whether you're a follower of Christ, whether you've been baptized or not been baptized, you have probably felt something from God. In fact, I'm pretty sure you have. Some sense inside of you that says, hey, I, I want to do this for you. Some of you immediately discounted it. Not going to receive that, no. I've had too many disappointments from God to be able to hear this one, so I'm not even going to do it because I don't want to be disappointed again. Others, you've glammed on to it. You held on to it. 18 years ago, God spoke to our church and said, hey, we're going, to, we're going to have a church building in Snoqualmie Ridge. If you know anything about Snoqualmie Ridge, there is no platted land for a church. None of the, none of the city officials plotted any land for a church, anything. Got some parks, got some other nice things, but churches were just not on the city planet at all. So when we went to go look for land, couldn't find anything. So there was a plot of land, about 1.9 acres. We said, hey, we'll, we'll buy that as an investment. And then when the time comes, we can actually get our church home because 1.9 acres is not big enough for a, a church home. We'll, we'll then sell it and we'll, we'll get the land we find here on the ridge and something will come open, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward 16 years. We start looking for land. And again, nothing, 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 nothing. Like, God, we felt like you promised us that we were going to have a church and there's just nothing available. One of the guys in our church, Del Brevik, says, hey, Charlie, what if we looked at that 1.9 acres? Get some architects together and see if they can't figure out something. He says, oh, Dale, we, 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 need a, we need a bigger place. You know, 40,000 square feet, probably minimum. There's no way you're going to fit that on that. Just, it doesn't, doesn't work. An acre is 44,000 square feet, so where are you going to park, right? 
said, well, you know, you can go up. Had some ideas. And wouldn't you know it, in the midst of everything that couldn't happen, you are sitting here today because somebody said, let's trust God for a promise that seems crazy. And many of you gave and you were here in this building because people said, I will trust the Lord in the midst of it. Let me ask you, what promise has God dropped in your heart? What was that thing that God spoke to you about? And you went, there's no way. That's crazy. It's hard to imagine that will ever come to pass. Maybe you've been looking for other ways to try to get the answer, trying to help God out. But look what Abraham did. He did what many of us, some of us have done. Some of you have done. Number two, we believe the promise. Hey. Hey, verse six says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. God's a good on you, Abram. Nice job. Way to go, man. Way to trust me. Way to declare and decree. Way to receive the promise even before it's happened yet. Man, that is so good of you. You know, it's like when your kids trust you. Isn't that amazing when they do? Like, oh, you know, so much time they doubt you. Yeah, mom, that'll never happen. Yeah, mom, you've said that before. You didn't do it, <laughs> right? Hey, dad, yeah, if you're at Disneyland, yeah, you went to Disneyland four times and you're a kid. Grandpa told me. You've never taken me and you keep promising. <laughs> right? But what if your kids go, oh, dad, you're taking us to, wow. Right? You count them as blessed. You count them as favored when they trust you. And here, God is counting him as righteous because he had the faith for it. But as time goes by, Disneyland doesn't happen. As time goes by, the promise is not there. No child comes. We come to number three. We doubt the promise. In Abraham's case, between the promise of saying, hey God, I believe you, and, you, and he favored him, to the time when he doubted the promise was 7.58 seconds. Yes, God, I believe. <gasps> Remember the guy? Help thou my unbelief. I actually timed it. Then the Lord said, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land as your possession. That took 7.58 seconds to read. The very next, uh, the very next verse. But Abraham replied, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure? I believe. How can I be sure, though? How can I be sure that will actually happen? Abraham started to doubt. You come to church. You sing the songs. The ladies do great this morning. What a, what a great job. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, the, you sing the songs of faith. You, you're, 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 you're riding high. You believe God. The preacher says something that resonates inside of you. And before you get out of the car, though, you're already doubting felt good in there. Well, oh, I got to go back to reality. How can I be sure? He asked the same question that Abram asked. How can I be sure? How can I be sure that God is going to be there? How can I be sure that what the Bible says, what the preacher says is actually going to happen? How can I be sure? Hebrews 6 has this beautiful line in it. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. We have this hope. It's an anchor for our soul. When everything else around us says it's not going to happen, something deep inside says, hey, it's going to happen. And so the question is, it depends on where you've placed your anchor. We used to have a boat when I was growing up. And we'd go out to the Bodega Bay. And my brother and I thought, hey, we, we, can, we can handle this. And so we're out in the middle of the bay, and you've got to be careful because the winds will blow your boat, the tides will blow your boat, the currents will take your boat, and there's shores along there where there's rocks, there's shores along there that are just bulrushes, there's just stuff there. You can end up on the absolutely wrong part of the world um, uh, out there. And so you drop that anchor. I know a lot of people that go to church. Their anchor's in the water. You look at them from the outside, it's like, hey, they've got their anchor in. Hey, they got a Bible. Hey, they even go to small group. They're, they're, man. 
but their lives are continually drifting up against these banks and these shores where they were never expecting to go. Why? Because the water is not the anchor for your soul. The water is water. And the water will ebb and flow and the currents will push you and the winds will blow you. If you're not all the way down to the bottom, you're not all in where that thing has hooked on to something solid. You may look like everybody else, but you keep ending up in the wrong place, in disappointments, and all kinds of forces are pushing you around. When the anchor is just in the water, it doesn't hold. What's your water? Oh, we got lots of things. Our looks. Your looks have gotten you through. Some of you are just phenomenal. You've used it, and you've used it well because it's gotten you ahead. Your money. Man, that's my security. That's where I've anchored into. My, my relationship, my spouse. Oh, man, that's awesome. Oh, that's kids. Finally got the kids. Accomplishments. The problem with anchoring in water Eventually, they let you down. Today, you may be riding high on the tide, but that tide's going to go back out, and tomorrow, your looks start to sag, and your money doesn't restore your marriage. The one you placed your relationship in, parent, they pass away, your kids leave home. We need an anchor for our soul that is sure and firm. Leroy Nya, 101 years old. Great grandparent, four generations of families who are anchored in the rock of ages. When he closed his eyes at 101, he, he was not asking, how can I be sure? He didn't leave millions of dollars, didn't leave land and houses, but he left an example to his family to be anchored in Christ. The crazy thing that happens next in Abram's life, God doesn't scold him. You know, if I'm God, hey, I'm, I'm God. You're doubting me. Abram, you just said you believe. Now you don't believe? What, what, what 7.58 seconds? You're already in the doubt phase? I take my fat favor back. Count, I don't count you as righteous. Give me that back. That's not what the Bible says. Abraham's just a guy like us. And here's what's amazing, because God is not mad at us because we doubt. He doesn't take his blessing away because we want to know how we can be sure. You go to number four, God does something strange. Instead of scolding him, instead of rebuking him, instead of taking his blessing away, he looks at Abram and he says, go get me a young heifer, Go get me a female goat and uh, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. God, how can I be sure? Hey, go, go get me some animals. <laughs> what? I want to know how you can be sure. What are we doing to her, you know, animal party, you know, petting zoo? What are you, God, what are you doing? I want to know how he can be sure. But notice what Abram does. Abram presented all these to him and he killed them. Before God ever tells him anything to do with them, he takes them and he kills them. So it says, then he cut each of the animals down the middle, laid the half side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Poor little birdies, he left them whole. Uh, some of the vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abram chased them away. Oh, this is crazy. What? God, how can I be sure? Go meet some animals. Okay. Got the animals, cut them down, spread them out. Well, we'll save the little birdies, but we'll wring their neck. All right, put them down there. Birds come, get out of here, you stupid buzzards. We don't know what that was all about because we didn't live 4,000 years ago. Um, I used to work at a Dodge dealership. I, uh, I did F&I, finance and insurance, and... Um, when people would buy a car, say they buy a car, then they'd come back to the F&I person. That's where we do all the paperwork and get them a 
a loan at the bank or loaning the money or whatever. Before they could ever drive off the lot with that car, they had to sign like 12,000 papers. And the print was this big. You never knew what it said. I didn't know what it said. I told, oh, yeah, it says nothing. Just sign here. Uh, <clears throat> no, I tried to help them out the best I could. But um, they, they put their name on that line. Until their name was on that line, they couldn't drive off of that car. All the consequences of if they didn't make that payment were laid out there. Here's what it meant. They signed their name, and then we'd hand them the keys and bless them, and they, they'd go their way. I, I'm a pastor. I do weddings, and uh, you know, I have a couple up here, and they'll say, you know, for better, for worse, Richard reports, blah, 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 and then, uh, you know, bless them, and, and everyone will clap, and yay, we'll go, hey, before you guys eat cake, I'll grab the bride and groom. Before you guys eat cake, before you do anything else, grab your attendance. We're going to go back here and sign the marriage license. And so the bride signs and the pictures are taken, the groom signs, pictures are taken, the attendant sign, and then finally I sign. Now you're married. Nobody, if nobody's there, just the photographer and a few, a few me, and now you're married. Now I'm married until you put your, put your signature on there. The contract is signed. Well, back in Abram's day, they didn't have paper. They didn't have big pins, no sharpies. So if we're going to make a covenant, we're going to act out what will happen if we break the contract. We're going, to, we're going to show it to everybody. Here's what will happen. We're going to take an animal. We're going to split it in half. We're going to splay its carcass all over the place. And the birds of the air are going to come open it up and eat it for lunch. May that happen to me if I break my covenant with you. Look at uh, uh, in Jeremiah. It says, because you have broken the terms of our covenant... I will cut you apart just as you cut apart the calf when you walk between the halves to solemnize your oath, your vows. Abram asked, how can I be sure? Go get some animals. We're going to seal this deal. We're going to make a contract. We're going to make a covenant. You know, today we have the bride and groom sign a piece of paper. That's so lame. We had to have a cut an animal off and say, hey, you break this, this marriage. Yeah. Wimpy. <laughs> Contra sign. How can I be sure? When a king would take over a lesser kingdom, or there'd be a treaty between two kings, they would use this very act and say, hey, uh, uh, one, of, one of two things would happen. The one who was taken over would then take those animals, cut them in half, walk between them and say, king, if I break this treaty, if I rebel against you or something, may what happens to these animals happen to me. May I be cut off. May the birds of the air come and eat at my flesh. If there are two kings who make a treaty together, the, both the kings would walk through. Hey, I'm agreeing to it, you're agreeing to it, yes. If we break this treaty, we attack one another. Never, ever, ever would a king who took over a lesser kingdom have to do that. It was always, right? But look what happens here. God does something even stranger. Verse 17. After the sun went down and darkness fell. Notice that. Abram saw, this is wild, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. Flaming torch, smoking fire pot. What? It's like some kind of cartoon or something. It's very, very hard for translators to translate this from the original language. They, they scratch their heads. How do we, how do we put this? What, what do these words actually mean? And they, they never get it quite 100% right, but these same words are used in a number of other places in, the, in your Bible, and so you kind of begin to put the pieces together, and it's not a hard leap when you begin to see where these other same kinds of words, smoking pot, flaming torch, where, where, where is that? One of them is, we looked at last week at Pentecost. There on Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments, the same thing, the smoking pot, the flame came down and hit that mountain. Another one in Ezekiel, chapter 1, where you see this creature with eyes on every side and it's flowing with wings and it can go in any direction. It's a picture of the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present God of the universe. And Ezekiel's seeing this thing, but he can't really describe it. And he sees the smoke and the fire. Moses at the burning bush. The bur bush was burning. And the voice of the Lord spoke out. What's going on here? 
Verse 18 says, so the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. The Lord himself in the flame and the smoke walked through. God, how can I be sure, Abram? May I be cut off. May the impossible be possible. May the birds of the air eat my carcass if I ever break my promise with you, Abram. I will pass through. Here's the, here's the strangest thing ever. I, I know what Abraham's thinking. Okay, God, I, I think I can trust you to keep your word. Kind, I, I help my unbelief, but I, but I think I can trust you to keep your word. The problem, God, is I, I don't know if I can keep my word. W what if I blow it again? What if I go through the waters of baptism and say I'm all in and then all of a sudden I, I, I mess up and you're looking at me and saying, okay, Charlie, really the 50th time? How many times, Charlie? This is like number 52. You, get, you keep doing the same thing. Um, I want you to try to find it in your Bible. Never once does God ask Abram to walk through the carcasses. What does he do? He says, Abram, I'm going through for both of us. What I'm saying, Abram, is if you break your promise, the curse will be on me. I'll pay the debt if you don't pay the payment. I'll take it. The birds of the air will do to me what should be done to you if you break your promise. And that's exactly what happened. Fast forward 2,000 years. In Mark chapter 16, it says, in the sixth hour, a great darkness fell. And the whole land. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried on that cross, Eli, Eli, lemo sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the voice from heaven is God saying, because you said you would take the curse that belongs to Charlie. You said, may it happen to you what Charlie deserves. You said you would keep the promise and pay the penalty for his brokenness. We have this hope, an anchor for our soul. I'm gonna let it go all the way down through all the stuff of this world, all the stuff that we try to hold on to that's just water and get it down deep. It's firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where all the blood was. And look what it says, and Jesus passed before. Go to the next slide, please. Verse 20, where Jesus went before and entered in. I'm going to ask the ladies to come back, band members coming up here. We're going to sing one song and then we're going to receive the Lord's table together. So you can have a sure and firm foundation for your soul. God, how do I know? How can I be sure? Oh, I've walked through for you. Do you realize that salvation is not a participatory sport? It's not you, God does his part, you do your part. It's not God helps them who helps themselves. No, 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 God does it all. I'll do all of it, it's on me. Just get your anchor down. It is something solid. You guys ready? Because I'll keep preaching. And it'll be two hours like I did with Melissa. And
allow my blood to be spilled so yours doesn't have to. I'm going to pay for every penalty that you've ever committed and any that you ever will commit. That's the amazing thing. Because I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go, God, how can I be sure? together again and then I'll dismiss you guys. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. I really love you guys. Thank you for being a part of this great church and wonderful family. Our prayer team is here as always. They want to pray for you, encourage you, lift you up. Have a wonderful day. Bless your grads today. Watch over them. God bless you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.